On March 10th, the Allentown Art Museum welcomed internationally recognized artist Yinka Shonabar for a conversation about his work, Girl Balancing Knowledge 3. Just a day earlier, the most significant work ever commissioned by the museum arrived for curators to assemble and put in place. Yinka Shonabari, MBA, RA, moved to Lagos, Nigeria. At the age of three, he was born in London. He returned to the UK to study fine art at Byron Shaw School of Art in London and Goldsmiths College in London, where he received a master's in fine art. His work examines race, class, and the construction of cultural identity through a sharp political commentary of the tangled interrelationships between Africa, Europe and their respective economic and political histories. His work is included in notable museum collections, including the Tate in London, National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Moderna Musette in Stockholm, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, among others. His new commission with the Public Art Fund, Wind Sculpture, SG1, opened at the Darcy Friedman Plaza in Central Park earlier this week and will be on display there until October 14th, 2018. And I want to say that. If you have the opportunity to go, please do. It is magnificent. So with that as an introduction, I welcome you here. Thank you for being here, and thank you for what you did uh, with the sculpture that we're going to be talking about tonight. Thank you. So my first question is um, what we talked about before. Can you give a little perspective on what made you an artist, what led up to your being an artist, what influences, ideas, situations? you encountered that told you you were going to be an artist? Yes, well, first of all, I must say, you know, thank you very much for having me here. And, um, you know, thanks also for the acquisition. Um, and uh, it's uh, my bank manager is quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so um, <laughs> uh, I should have a retort to that, but. <laughs> So I started really doing art, you know, when I was at school. And I, you know, I liked doing it. I was, um, the first works I really looked at, but now I was really quite young. Um, you know, the usual thing for a young person, you know, the surrealist and impressionist and, and so on. And, um, but also, you know, most importantly, I got, you know, I was, um, I often tell this story about, you know, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and the traffic in Lagos is actually, you know, quite bad. And so the driver was always late picking me up because traffic was bad. So I used to actually take refuge in the art room. And so let's put it this way, I owe my career to bad traffic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I, I kind of developed my work, you know, when I was young from school, really. Okay. Did the experiences in Lagos and then going back to London affect you in significant ways? Well, you know, going back to London uh, when I was 17 years old, um, I mean, I, you know, I went back to, do, to go to art school. And so when I got to art school, I was rather surprised because when I was at art school, you know, as somebody who grew up in Lagos, I was interested in global politics, and um, I started making work about what was happening in Russia uh, at that time. So I was doing work about perestroika, you know, thinking I'm a citizen of the world, I can, you know, make work pretty much about anything. And, and then I was told, actually, when I got to London, that I was black. I didn't know I was <laughs> until I got to London. And then I realized I was, a, you know, I was a black African who should really make work only about being black African. And I, um, so the whole question, my teacher said, well, you're African, you're of African origin, aren't you? Why aren't you producing authentic African art? So the whole question about authenticity really, I started to engage with that idea. What does authenticity mean? How do you make authentic African art? You know, does an English person make authentic English art? What does that really mean? So I went to Brixton Market, 
where I saw those fabrics, the batik fabric, and I, you know, I saw those fabrics when I was young. I was very familiar with them, but I always imagined the fabrics were African fabrics. And so on speaking to them, you know, they said the fabrics are Indonesian influenced fabrics produced by the Dutch and then for sales into the African market. And I realized the kind of the trade routes and the relationship between different cultures that have actually created, you know, the batik fabrics. And so in a way, that's kind of where, where the, you know, where the work kind of came from. So then I started to actually use the fabrics. The first series I did, so that's a piece called Double Dutch. And I was, you know, having had the training at art school, I'd studied art history, you know, so I'd looked at abstract expressionism and, you know, Rothko, Jackson Pollock, Barnett Newman. Well, a lot of those works were usually kind of heroic paintings, you know, mostly by white men. And I wanted to do, to make an intervention into, you know, what is abstract painting and what's the relationship of painting to popular culture? You know, something from the market and then, so I decided to fragment those paintings and, you know, to kind of paint onto fabric and then paint. You know, when I was a student, I started life drawing. You know, and I was told, you know, not to use vulgar colors in my work, not to, so I decided, okay, we'll, we'll find the least vulgar color to use. <laughs> <laughs> so let's object to the, to the standard canon. <laughs> yes, no, okay. exactly. So, so that, that's kind of really the beginning. So this is the first work that you, or yeah, not Yeah, this first? is the first, uh, there was one before this, mm -hmm. but this is the first one that got shown in a museum, yeah. Okay, and these are painted fabrics? Yes, yes, so it's acrylic on, on fabric, so on the side, so I alternated between painting on the side and painting on the front. But that's actually very important because metaphorically speaking, the notion of, you know, the margin and the center, I was actually doing here formally. I mean, that would then come to, that would then enter a lot of the way that I were to, you know, I would work in the future. So I'm going to jump for a second. Is this the precursor in a certain sense for what you did in Central Park? Well, it, well, in a way, yes. In Central Park, you know, I was looking at the whole idea of sculpture itself and sculpting the intangible. You know, when we get to public sculpture, I will talk more about this because this evolved out of another work that I did. So how does a girl like you get to be a girl like you from 1995? This was your... Uh, your piece that was entered into the Sensations ex exhibition. How did you make the leap between painted fabrics on, that, on a painting and a two-dimensional surface to a three-dimensional surface that takes that concept of hybridity multiple steps further? Yes, I mean, the interesting thing about the things I explore in my work is that this work may seem very different from the painting but actually it's a continuation of, of, of the same concerns. Um, because in the previous work, I was thinking about the notion of high art versus popular culture. And here we're thinking about class versus popular culture fabrics, you know, so it's a, but also give, at the time that this work was made, in the context of the art world, artists were thinking seriously about identity issues. So, you know, I was, at the same time, I was thinking about this, but I was also seeing, you know, works by Cindy Sherman, by Barbara Kruger, by, you know, um, lots of other people, you know, Rosemary Trockel, you know, Nancy Sparrow. Um, so there were people thinking about their own, um, you know, female identities. So um, politics and feminism and the civil rights movement were very much also in the background. I was encountering all of these things as a young, as a young artist. So the work was, you know, activism was kind of also in the background, you know, asking a lot of questions. Where do I come from? Why do I have this um, identity? Why am I speaking English to you now? 
that happened as a result of the colonization of Nigeria by Britain. So, and then I went to the Victoria and Albert Museum where I was looking at a lot of aristocratic dress. And then I thought a good thing to do would be to do what I call ethnicizing the aristocracy. So, so, so that's actually where the, uh, you know, this, this um, series, you know, began. Do you view this work as protest art, as, um, as political art, and as subversive? Well, all of the above. Okay. It's, uh, you know. Struck it out of the ballpark. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's subversive, it's poetic, it's dark, it's glamorous, it's challenging. And it's also asking a lot of questions about, you know, what is art? What can be art? So when you did this, were you thinking that this would be placed in a museum? That it was going into sensations? Um, well, the work was actually commissioned by the Barbican Gallery in London. They had a show on textiles. And they invited me because they knew, you know, they'd seen the paintings. And so I think they imagined I was going to just put the paintings in. And I said, oh, no, I want to do something else. So I did, you know, I did this. And then after that exhibition, um, at that time, Charles Saatchi in London was very big in the art world. It was, you know, collecting in a big way. So he acquired um, that piece. And then he put that piece in Sensation. As we flip through this, we're looking at, if you stay here, we're looking at photographs. We're looking at installations. Um, we're looking at sculpture, we're looking at painting. As an artist, how do you bring all that together or decide which medium you're going to go with at any given point in time? I think that the media is not necessarily the art. I mean, it's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So basically, I like to express things in a way which suits the medium I'm going to work in. Um, but as an artist, you know, I mean, I don't want to bore myself too, so I need to, you know. You change often. Yes, and I need to keep pushing the boundaries of my practice. You know, but I, but you know, I enjoy actually trying different ways of working. You sound like a museum director. <laughs> um, of not wanting to get bored and constantly challenging the process, so yeah, it yeah, resonates. Yeah. So let's go to Cake Man. So, I wanted to include this in the discourse because it's really one of the, one of the first times for me where humor uh, plays a huge part, where balance plays a part, where movement and struggle plays a part, and where surprise plays a part. So can you talk a little bit about what went into both of these? The one thing I always think about in terms of works of art is that ultimately the audience completes the work. And so meaning can be open. But the, what motivated this work, this was at the time of the financial crisis. And I was thinking about greed and people literally wanting all the cake for themselves. And so I was really thinking about, you know, the Wall Street guy, you know, that's kind of got, you know, got everything. But but it's potentially, you know, I mean, all those things could come crashing down anytime. You know, it's, it's, it's quite precarious, you know. And so it's kind of wanting to do work about that time, but in a way that sort of, um, you know, that people can want to engage with. So this too has meanings beyond, or it's a metaphor. Um, beyond just the issue of cake, beyond just the issue of, of movement, there's a social, political discussion going on here that reflects yes. times which we're yes. living in. Yeah. So um, is this one of the first times that you dealt with figures that are bent over? And there's a reason why I'm asking for that, because the knowledge series yeah, yeah, deals yeah. with a lot of movement, and our sculpture deals with a figure that is bent over and is balancing things on the back. Yeah. Um, is this one of the first times you've done that? I did the... Girl Bands in Knowledge series, I think, before I did this. You know, the most important aspect of this to me, this work is 
you know, it's feminists. It's also, um, you know, it's actually challenging a lot of assumptions within our society and about, it's also about uh, power, right? And the role, ultimately, the role of young women within our society. And that it's also dangerous if we don't educate young women or we don't provide the, the opportunities. It's dangerous also for our, all of our futures and our economy. Because ultimately, if you educate young women, you educate the society. And so it's, it's discrimination is actually dangerous. You know, and that's what's so kind of precarious about it in, 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 in that sense. But also, you know, I think with education and the acquisition of knowledge, it's hard. It's also a struggle. But it's something worth doing, too. So, but then the work itself, there's something sort of poetic about it, you know, the costumes and the, you know, and the books. And, and so visually, even though the subject matter behind the work is quite serious, it's very important for me that it feels visually light. It does not feel, you know, but then if you were to actually think of it or what the work is trying to say. And on the globe head, uh, there are names of writers of a multicultural background. So it's sort of inclusive. You know, it's got many names on there. And again, you know, it's really talking about the inclusive nature of education, you know, and that also we should be broad-minded in the way that we, you know, the things we're curious about should be diverse. And we should also give that opportunity to a diversity of young people and particularly young women. So can you also relate that to the fabric and to the images on the, on the fabric? Well, I mean, the, the fabrics are, you know, you can see lights. Um, and I chose that fabric because of the, you know, again, it's, it's just a great metaphor, you know, uh, shining light on something. Um, and, uh, you know, just the potential for, uh, you know, for the emancipation, if you like, of the young woman. Well, I think that one of the reasons we're so enamored with the work is because it is poetic and it is lyrical and at the same time it is extremely serious yeah. and it addresses issues that are prevalent in us being a museum and a museum being about civil discourse but also about education and about the transmission of knowledge yeah. and about the reinterpretation of knowledge over time yes and the potential transformation of society as well if we were to understand the importance of providing those opportunities. We've passed through a number of objects just now that, 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 that you've done in which the globe is, a, is a, a map of continents, the globe is a star map, the globe is a, a, a metaphor for, for knowledge from authors about books. Where did that all start for you? And how do you think about that globe in replacing the heads that are missing in a sense, in, in a progression? Um, well, if we look through our, um, you know, 18th century collections within museums, 19th century collections within museums, uh, there is a sense of um, excluding a whole group of people, you know, either because of their ethnicity or, you know, uh, their history is not well, uh, well featured in those collections. Um, or if those histories are featured, they often can be quite negative. And so I wanted my figures to be universal and I want them to be inclusive. And the best metaphor I found for that is to actually have a globe, which I thought would include everybody and would not discriminate. So, because they are symbolic figures, you know, they're not one specific type of person. I mean, even if you look, were to look closely, 
I mean, my figures are neither white nor black. Right. There's something in between. So they are kind of, they are about the essence of humanity, not the, you know, racial type. So I wanted to um, show two other earlier works that relate to balancing knowledge and see if there's anything else you wanted to add to the, to the conversation. Our work is part of a longer term discourse within your work. And it is important for us to understand um, the context behind the creation of the work, what came before it, what's going to come after it, but also this dedication to the idea of, of knowledge and the transmission of, of, of knowledge and the idea that knowledge and education needs to be accessible across the board without discrimination. Yes. So um, these are two of your earlier works on, on the balancing knowledge? Yes. Sure. yes. And is there anything you wanted to add to this conversation? Because these are, this one is a little, a, a little stayed, but that one is actually in, 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 in a more active, aggressive means of coming apart. Well, you see, that, that one also relates closely to my childhood because I have very strict Nigerian parents, right? And so when, um, and so my father, you know, just to give you the background, you know, my, my father was a lawyer and he wanted me to do law and he was very, you know, uh, um, so the idea, you know, when I announced that I wanted to be an artist, he was absolutely shocked. Um, and so, but when I used to go to school in the car, um, and, you know, my father was kind of like that character in um, The Sound of Music, a very, very strict, you know, dad. And so I used to, um, you know, I would be sitting in the car and he'd it, say, why are you looking around? Why are you not reading? Why are you not reading your book? You know, so it was always, you know, education, 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 you know, and, um, and so, and I, so I was uh, thinking about my childhood when I made that piece. And, um, you know, and I was a, I was a huge rebel. I, I, you know, I was really rebellious as well against this whole, you know, structure. But then later in life, actually, I found that, you know, he was right. You know, he was right. He, he, you know, it was actually, I, I feel that my own, um, you know, emancipation in a way, uh, is actually due to the power of, of learning. Uh, and, 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 you know, so there's that kind of the, the rebellious side on the one side, and then, you know, on, understanding later on in life that how important learning is. So I'd like to go back to Magic Ladder, since this is almost on our doorstep. So this was commissioned uh, with the Barnes Foundation. Yes. There are people who are ascending, young youth, a boy and a, and a girl, ascending a ladder. Each of the, each of the steps is a, is a book. What was the relationship in the commission between the educational theory that led to the Barnes collection uh, and, and, and Barnes's collecting um, and your work? Well, so I was invited to do um, a show at the Barnes Foundation. And, you know, I did some research and I learned that, you know, uh, that Dr. Barnes himself was, um, you know, he was very keen on education and his staff, they had access to the art collection and he promoted education, he supported, you know, uh, colleges. And I felt that, you know, I wanted to do something that will express that, that aspiration that he had. And he was very generous also in supporting education. And so I decided to do, you know, a ladder, which is for me a symbol of, you know, emancipating yourself by stepping up. And knowledge would, would allow you to step out of whatever situation you might find yourself in terms of your class or your background. Uh, and it just seemed absolutely right, given what he actually believed in. And, you know, so it was great to actually make a work uh, for that show. And I was told that the last thing they uh, commissioned was uh, with Suzanne. And uh, so, but I was glad they told me after I made the work, not before. <laughs> no pressure there at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things which I really um, 
appreciate about this work and a lot of your work, and especially the work with us, is that um, the thinking behind the work directly relates to the, to the mission and, and, and culture of the institution, as well as broader cultural issues. So thank you for that. I would like to go to the guest projects in London and have you talk about that a little bit, because I thought when I learned about it, it was fascinating um, as, as a way of supporting artists. Yes. Yeah, so in my studio in London, I have a project space. And I've run the project space for about 10 years. There's a box outside the space, and artists put their proposals in that. You know, and then we select artists to have the space for a month. And it's all different art forms. So it's you know, dance, visual arts. And we also do supper clubs every three months based on artists to raise money for the, for the project. And so I've been running, so that's been going now for about 10 years. And so on the second phase, I've just, I'm just about to build a residency space in Lagos, Nigeria, so that I can bring international artists over there. They will have the space to work in for a few months and you know, make work, but, but most importantly, cultural exchange um, is really the reason why I'm doing that. Those are some of the, 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 the plans for that, for that building. Uh, and then in parallel to this, about an hour out of Lagos, I'll do uh, a farm where residents can also go and stay if they want quiet. You know, it's a bit romantic at the moment, but the idea is that the residency will be supplied with the food you know, from the farm. So we will grow, grow our own. Yeah, so that's the kind of... Um, and this is designed for artists who would like to remove themselves for a while, yes. rethink? Yeah. Where's the application process? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, and then I will be uh, collaborating with a number of institutions to actually support the artists to come. So I can't really afford to bring all the artists myself. But I will, um, you know, create a, a board, and then I will try to collaborate with institutions. In the space in London, what kind of a space is that? Is that just a black box? Or no, no, it's a it's a, a warehouse. But uh, so the the top part of it is my studio, and then the ground floor is. Um, and how it's, do you but it's in the east end of London. How do you select? How do you uh, the artists who showed there previously. Select the next group of people. Twice. Yeah. That's one of our supper clubs. And we've had supper clubs based on, you know, uh, Louis Bourgeois, um, Andy Warhol, and, you know, and a chef cooks a meal based on the life of that person. So it's a lot of fun. We have fun, but we also raise money for the space. Fantastic. Um, I want to thank you for the generosity of your time and your thoughts and all the work that you've done and for the commission that you delivered to us, which we are enamored with. Um, and to say thank you for everything you've done, for all of your work, for all of the poetry. And my thanks to you for being here today. We look forward to you coming back.